You are listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. This episode is a highlight clip from this week's full episode. To listen in on the complete conversation, see the show notes for the link to the complete show. You can help us out by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate every bit of your support. I'm Morgan McKittrick, your producer, and this is Decidedly. So it's, it really is, you know, decisions are an important part of uh, making investments and everything. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different trends that you can make decisions. You can make bad decisions, but making no decision is, is, is worse than making a bad decision in my mind. Now, I think the public probably thinks differently. They want to cancel everyone that, uh, you know, makes a bad decision, but that is what it is. <laughs> No, you're totally right. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're in the minority in the belief it placing a premium on speed. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people who who feel like um, they want to avoid making a bad decision without recognizing that that no decision is in fact a decision. It's a decision not to act, and while they're not acting, the world's moving past them. And I, I think it's particularly challenging for um, groups and committees. And, and you know, you talked about I, I was. Uh, had a discussion this past week. I sold a business a couple of years ago and uh, was doing some coaching with them afterwards. And we realized that there was some real friction in the decision-making. And so it was curious to me. And what I had observed was, and I made this comment to them, I, I said, it looks like you guys have conflicting values, you know, so that one of the, there were four owners and I said, you know, you guys are not on the same page what we finally realized was that they were having difficulty making decisions because the values that I had had and and the vision that I had written for the company, they were still operating on, but they weren't aligned with those values and vision. It didn't make them bad. They were just different. And so they were making decisions based on the internal values that they had not cleared with each other. And so they had a different set of values among them uh, hadn't agreed on the new values and everybody was still sort of thinking they should have been making decisions based on the values that I had had, or I, I had established for the company, you know, some 15 years prior. And so they were really having difficulty and it was creating a lot of friction on decision-making. I want to go back to, you were talking about linear decision-making versus exponential decision-making. Tell me the difference between those two. Well, I, I think just to add to your point there, Sean, about what you're saying is the, the values are, that's that that's getting that personal, professional, and organizational more aligned is understanding each person's mm-hmm. values and biases and where they come from is important to have real conversations. And I think, you know, oftentimes we, yeah. we, we shadow that, you know, and this just goes our own belief systems. And so far, we, you know, we have very divisive beliefs these days because of the world and nature of news and how we get it. Um, is bringing those together to understand that they do affect just the simplest of decisions. And that leads into kind of your question about linear versus exponential. Our whole lives we lived, you know, I think it goes to Sanger's comment about like, what, why do we need to change? Well, you know, if you look back on your life, you know, you're going to look chronologically and you say a year ago, I did this and three years ago, I did this. And it's very much going to look like just progress year by year by year. Now, a lot of people live you know, their life one year at a time. And, you know, they say I have 20 years experience, but they really have one year 20 times. And that's the unacceptable part of not making decisions or moving forward to be exponential because exponential is about growth. So I call it the exponential mindset. And if you're going to shift one, I'm sure you've talked a lot about the growth mindset on this podcast and heard a lot about, you know, Hey, everyone needs a growth, not a fixed mindset, which is very linear. Um, But the growth mindset to add to that is, you know, adding a positive attitude about the future because you got to think positively about your company or whatever decision, your investment you make. I mean, you shouldn't make it if you're not, if if you don't think positively about it. Um, You have to then uh, have that growth mindset. You know, what is this going to, what are we going to have to do to really scale into this? And then you have to think big. And that's where the part that I can challenge people is if I asked, you know, where decidedly is going to be in, in five years, you know, you guys are loving what you're doing. Well, how do you grow at hundred X? How, you know, how do you, you know, what is hundred X to you? What is 10 X to you? And when you start trying that on, what does that mean? Well, obviously it's probably a different experience and it's something that'll challenge your own brain to say, ah, I've always been thinking linear. I just know what I need to do this next year. And Bill Gates has a quote that I have in my book that, 
people often overestimate what they'll do in one year, but mm -hmm. underestimate what they'll do in 10 yeah. years. And that's where yeah. I always like the people, I have a whole chapter about thinking long-term because if you think longer term, if you start thinking 10 years out, you can start to think exponential. And that goes, you know, I have a story in the book about Elon Musk that talks about, there's not many companies that are saying in 2040, they're going to land on Mars, right? So he has SpaceX. So I actually invented a, you know, a term called Mars shots because Google has moon shots. Well, Elon Musk was just like, I got to think bigger than that. I'm going to put, we're going to go to Mars in 2040. And we're going to civilize it. Well, regardless if he ever gets there or not, <laughs> He's now shuttling, he's the largest private space company, shutting astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station. He's already accomplished, in a way, a Mars shot, you know, much bigger than any other privatized space. And he's starting to win the war on talent over NASA, which has historically been the best place to work on the planet. Where they have very low turnover because you have your very people that are working on the biggest things in the world. So all of a sudden, when you can start thinking bigger, one, you're going to sound really crazy to people around you that are not used to it. <laughs> And that's when you start thinking 10x or 100x. But yeah. I think once people, and, and I was with a company in Asheville that's a real estate company, and uh, their CEO said, you know, I used to stand in front of our group and people just thought I was crazy, but then we started hitting our goals. And then all of a sudden they believe, <laughs> and now they're pushing me to create bigger goals. So we're accelerating faster. They're making decisions faster. So I'm part of coaching that organization and, and really helping them think bigger. But, you know, their goal is now to be a Fortune 500 company. Um, they're a couple billion dollar real estate company, real estate holdings. And they literally want to, you know, really change the way this, this works. And they have a team now that thinks and believes it. All I can say is I would bet on the group that believes in something. A small group in the world has changed just about everything. And that's the part of galvanizing a group to think bigger. And that's that exponential mindset where... You see it when you talk to people that think exponentially versus linearly. And that was kind of really inspired this book of exponential theory, which the theory really is, is once you start to think bigger, you become more conscious. And what that really means is you start to think about all the different stakeholders that are involved. That rhodium rule that I, I talked about is thinking about the entire ecosystem. Um, when you do that, one, you start making more informed decisions. There's not unintended consequences. I don't want to point mm -hmm. anybody out, but you know, we've had a couple presidents, it doesn't matter which side you believe in or whatever, they both have done this, is really made decisions for a group of people, but not really cared about really the democracy or the, you know, the platform they represent. And I think what's important is not understanding that's the empathy that you have for the people that really support you or maybe look at like you or have the same religion or whatever it is. We have to get beyond that and really think about how do we think about all people? Because companies now on these platforms have to really think about all those different people as decision makers. Otherwise, they are going to they are going to suffer. They are going to be canceled in one way or another. And I think it's an important part of thinking bigger is to think more conscious. And that's really the theory, because I went in and out of all these exponential companies and I just saw that these CEOs that grew to be unicorns really quick or grew to be and they were able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. They just talked in a way, they had a language like this that was just, I was like, I need to learn this language. So I wrote a book about it to learn it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy for me. So in 10 years, I should be leading an exponential company. If I haven't, I'm not growing. I'm not leading in the way that I want to. Right, uh, right. And that's just part of my own exponential mindset and belief system is that I believe I'll do that now because I've wrote it into existence. And I really believe that I'm on that path to get there. And literally writing it is key. I... I had a trouble thinking big, um, until a few years ago, a friend of mine challenged me to write down my ideal day five years into the future. And it, I, partly because she nudged me and partly because I nudged myself to write down some things that I really didn't think were achievable. I mean, they, I really thought ah, this is not going to happen within five years. I couldn't see it. I really couldn't see them happening. And I wrote a couple of things down that I re remember very vividly. One of them was I woke up that morning on my ideal day and I gave an interview for CNBC. And then the other was that I, um, I woke up on a farm uh, 25 minutes from where I live right now uh, with, you know, a bunch, of, a lot of spacious land and, and animals and just it was something that I really wanted. I thought at the time, there's no way I'm getting on uh, TV in five years and there's no way I'm buying that farm in five years. Mm -hmm. And 
a year later, I was on Dr. Phil, uh, number one show on daytime. So even bigger than what I had imagined doing on CNBC. And then uh, just this past week, I am now under contract for that farm. And that's, I'm three years into this, not even three years into this five-year period. So I, you know, the power of thinking big, it impacted me. And as soon as I started to see those things happen, I was like, okay, okay. So I was discounting everything that I thought was possible because I'm looking at what I can see right in front of me. All of my other friends who did that exercise, they're at the same place where they're halfway through their five years and they're already 90% complete with all of the monumental milestones that were within that ideal day that they first saw. I, I had that, I had that same experience uh, when we, we moved our office about, oh, this was four years ago. And so I had this yeah. storage room where I'd put old files and notebooks and notes from conferences and all this stuff. It was just, you know, full of stuff. And so I had to go through that and finally just clear it out. So, you know, I'm just throwing stuff out. I come across this old notebook and I, and I had a page just like what you had talked about. And I had done it 10 years prior. So it was 10 years old yeah. and it was, what, what do I want to do in 10 years? Where am I going to be in 10 years? It was that far, yeah. but I had never, I had just gotten lost in the shuffle over the years. And I looked at that and like nine of the 10 had happened. And some of the rev, the revenue things were like almost spot on. Really? Yeah. It was amazing. Some of these things and some of them were just pie in the sky things like I'd like to do this and I'd like, and they had happened. And it's so I think there's a component. Imagine if we read those freaking papers instead of the balling them up <laughs> instead and putting of them just away. putting it in a storage room. All I had to do is write I, it down once and I achieved it. I didn't read it. That, right? I mean, yeah. Subconscious well, yeah, that's, work. that's my point. Yeah. Is, is that it, it, there was a subconscious impact of writing it down. That was powerful, you know, that I wasn't even aware of, you know, obviously subconscious. I, I had one just the, to, to follow your guys' point is, I found a piece of paper in, um, it was about five years. I put a date that I wanted to have uh, a girl. Don't ask me. I don't even remember doing this, but I put the date <laughs> April 30th, 2008. I did this like in 2003 and I had a daughter on April 30th, 2008. I did not find it till wow. like 2009, 2010. And I looked at it and it freaked me out. I'm not, you know, oh, you know the world works in mysterious ways, but I do, I do. It, it is all about, you know, I have this whole program called Exponential Mindset, Belief and Attitude that I help, you know, these leaders just create the mindset, belief and attitude to think bigger. And, you know, it's it's amazing when people believe in themselves what they can do. And I think so much of this world is we're doubting ourselves. And that's why we don't make decisions. Yeah, because we have fears and worries and anxieties and stress about the future. But the only time you can create the future is right now. And it's generally making a decision. And if it's a bad decision, it's good because you learn from it quickly and you can yeah. get over it. So it's, it's, it's getting people in that mindset to, to really grow and grow exponentially. And that's where Sanger, I would challenge you now and, and, and like Sean to do a 10 year one from today where you'll be in 10 years. <laughs> Thanks for making the great decision to listen into this week's episode highlight. If you want more of what you just heard, see the show notes for the full episode. As always, for the latest decision-making tips, find us on decidedlypodcast.com or on Instagram at decidedlypodcast. And be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter from the link in the show notes. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review as well. We read all of your comments, so if you learned some decision-making tips today, let us know. Until next time, this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.